Ask the average orthodox, somewhat learned individual to describe for you the mitzvah of Svira Sa'omer. I believe that you'll get quite a number of creative answers. Svira Sa'omer, oh yeah, that's because uh, the Kiva students died, and they died for, I think, 33 days, so we count because of that. Or it's got something to do with the Omer, or something to do with Shul, this is, uh, I'm not sure, but it, it's, it's, it's a mitzvah, it's something, it's, it's definitely a mitzvah. And it's very interesting to note that a lot of people will be very meticulous about counting, very particular to make sure that they count every night. And if they have any shallow sleekers, they'll immediately ask what the luck is, etc. But I think oftentimes we miss the basics in terms of what is the reason for the mitzvah. And the Sefer of is very clear. It says as follows. The Pesach says, Usart and Lachemi Machras HaShabbos, you should count from the day after the first day of Pesach, why is that? He says, because Koli Karach and Yisrael in Ela Torah. The entire reason that the Kli Yisrael exists is only for learning Torah, which is the Ikra Gadol. Because of that, they were Nigali. Because of that, they were redeemed. And that is the greatest good for them. And not only that, he says, in Gadol Hulahem, they're receiving the Torah and Arsina was a greater Indian to them. And Yosef and Achir Aldus, even more than they're going from slavery to freedom. So and the reason we count as the Sefer Echidah is because just like the Jewish people then had this great thing called this redemption, but to them that was small in comparison to the great day that was to come, which was Kabbalah's the Torah, they were to receive the Torah some 49 days after, just like they, even after being free, waited in anxious anticipation for the those days to pass till they receive the Torah, we too count the days down. We try to inculcate within ourselves that same sense of anticipation. I can't wait for that day to come. I can't wait for Kabbalah's Torah. Just like the Jews then had that sense, we count to put that same feeling within ourselves. And that, says the Sefer Chinuch, is the Tam, the reason for Sirius Omer, to remind ourselves of the great day coming, the Kabbalah's Torah, that we receive the Torah in our Sinai. However, of note, is one particular line that he says in that piece. And that is, to the Jews leaving Mitzrayim, Kabbalah's Torah, receiving the Torah in our Sinai, was a greater good to them, even more than their freedom from slavery. Meaning, if you put the two on a scale, leaving bondage versus getting the Torah, getting the Torah far outweighed was a much greater good to them, to the extent that they were waiting, waiting, waiting for that great day, namely Kabbalah's Torah, it outshadowed, outpowered the simple thing called leaving bondage. And if you think about it, I find that a very problematic statement. Because if we concentrate even for a minute on what it was like to be a slave in Mitzrayim and to be free, I think we'll find that statement that the Sefer Chim says very difficult to understand. And let's focus for a minute on what this means. The clients from Mitzrayim were absolute avodim, but not just a slave in the sense that we sometimes heard the expression slave. A Jew had no rights whatsoever. But that means in plain languages, a Jew had no right to own property, he had no right to protect his children, he had no right to sleep in any particular place. The Rambat explains that at any given time, any mystery could walk over to a Jew and say, you, you're coming with me, and he could make that Jew come with him for whatever amount of time he wanted it to be, whether it was two weeks, two months, any single mystery had the right to pick out any Jew and make him work for him for any amount of time. And with that came not just the shibud in the sense of oppression, but there was no rights of any sort that the Jews had. As an illustration of this, we're all familiar with the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu went out on that day. When he reached a certain age, he went out to see the pain of his brothers, and that day he killed the Mitzri. And Rashi explains why it is that he killed that Mitzri. The sister of Dosan Va'aviram, actually the sister of Dosan, was a very attractive woman. A Mitzri Nogesh had his eye on her. Now the system of government worked as follows. There was one Egyptian Nogesh who was on top of ten Jewish Shotrim. And those ten Jewish Shotrim were each responsible for ten Jews under them. So one Egyptian Nogesh, under him ten Jewish Shotrim, under him 
10 Jews. This particular Nogesh was in charge of that shelter. He came, this Egyptian came early one morning to the husband of that woman's tent, woke him up, and told him to go about his rounds of waking up his 10 Jews under his command. When this Jewish man was out, the Egyptian Nogesh came into the tent. She, the wife, assumed that in fact it was her husband's return. He lived with her, and she didn't know it. However, when the Jewish man went around to the various places to wake them up, he quickly realized it was way too early. He came back to his house, understood what had happened. That entire day, the Mitzri was beating that Jewish man. Because the Jewish man had found out what happened, the Mitzri was upset. Not that the Jew could have gotten him in trouble, because in no sense was it dangerous to do what he had done. However, the mystery felt that he was betrayed, his secret was found out, and he was beating this Jew and he was going to kill him. When Moshe Benu saw that, he saw such riches, he said to Shem Amofurish, and he killed this Egyptian. But the point being, if you were a Jew in Israel, you had no rights whatsoever, there was no recourse. If your children were stolen from your house, there was no one to run to, there was no one to cry to, you were beaten, you were tortured. And I think it's very hard for us to imagine the awesome simcha that the Jewish people felt when we were redeemed. Now we sit there on Pesach night, we try to imagine it, we try to envision it, but if you could put yourself back in the situation, you're a slave, you're oppressed, you're beaten, and then you see it day after day, day after day, month after month, and finally in a heartbeat you're free. Your freedom, you go from being an oppressed people to be an exalted nation, you're brought out into the Midbar with tremendous miracles. The joy and the happiness is hard to imagine. And yet the Sacred of is telling us that that joy was small in comparison to the joy and the anticipation of receiving the Torah. And the question that I think begs being asked of the Sefer of Hinoch is, how is that possible? Meaning, we're all Maksha Torah. And Torah is a very important thing. It's a tremendous mitzvah, and hopefully we even enjoy studying Torah. But if we were slaves and we were freed, that joy would be so powerful, so palpable, that it would be difficult to compare that in any sense to anything else. Surely it would greatly overshadow the birth of Torah, surely greatly overshadow even receiving the Torah. And yet again, the Savior kind of the saying that their receiving of the Torah was so great, their simple was so great that it greatly overshadowed their joy even of leaving slavery, and the question is, what's Pshat, how could it be? And to answer this, I'd like to see if we can get a little bit better understanding of some of the inner workings of the human. And to do that, I'd like to borrow a concept that was discussed back in Shmuz 21, Choosing a Career. In that Shmuz, we discussed the whole of this point, <clears throat> that when Hashem created each human, Hashem feels coming off of the responsibility as the creator to be mafarnes, to support that individual. So to speak, I brought you into the world, it's my responsibility to take care of you. And to afford that, Hashem gave each human being a teva, a nature, for a particular type of malacha. Each person has a different inclination, a different proclivity towards a type of work. One person enjoys working with their hands, another person is real good with numbers, another person is just real comfortable with the buying and selling routine. Each person has a different nature, a different inclination. <clears throat> Says the Lord of Lord, your job as a Jew is to be mishtadel, to find that area that you feel a certain natural draw to, be mishtadel in that area, whether it's sweet or bitter, know that that's what Hashem has decreed for you, There'll be ups, there'll be downs in the market. There'll be times when your industry is on top, times when it's low. You have to pursue it. That's what you should be doing as your Ishtamas. And that concept, I think, speaks volumes in terms of A, a person's happiness in life, and B, his real betoken in Hashem. Now, let's not misunderstand. It does not mean that if you have a particular enjoyment of working with your hands, you have to be the fellow to actually screw in the light bulb or actually put in the transmissions. It could be your lot in life is to own a large chain of car 
stores, car manufacturers, car repair, something in the line. But if that's your nati, if your nature is this type of malacha, then that's what you should be doing. And find a way to refine yourself within the confines of those activities. Okay. Now, that being said, I think there are three different things that brings a person job satisfaction. Every once in a while, you find a person who innately enjoys the type of work itself. I remember speaking to a child psychologist who I was very friendly with in Rochester. We spent a lot of time discussing different issues. And then one day we were talking about his schedule. This fellow was booking 12 to 14 patients a day. Now, if you've ever listened to whiny brand kids for more than about 10 minutes, you'll know it takes an awesome amount of patience. This fellow would sit there with 12 to 14 patients a day. I grant it, it's 45 minute slots, but that means from morning to night doing nothing but listening to children. And he said to me as follows, I do it because I love it. Meaning, he found tremendous satisfaction in listening to a child, seeing their world, and gently guiding them along the path to their finally more success in life, more happiness, being a more productive person. He found it very rewarding. He found it very, very enjoyable. And it wasn't a burden. It brought him tremendous simpa. And he loved his work. 12 hours a day was not hard. It was easy. There was a fellow I knew who was then a resident in medical school who described to me what it was like for him to be in the operating room. He said he played the job of what he called skiing. The surgeon would be doing the operation. He still, even though he was a resident, but still effectively he was a student, he would hold the forceps during the operation so that the, I guess, the opening would remain open and the surgeon could be inside doing his job. And he described it with such enthusiasm, such gusto, standing there, you know, so exciting and so interesting. And then he said the words to me. And I didn't even realize how quickly the five hours passed. I said, what? He stood there for five hours holding the forceps like this, and without moving, and he loved it. This is the guy who, from the time he was a little boy, dreamt about nothing other than being a doctor. For him, surgery was phenomenal. It was exciting. It was <clears throat> where the action was at. Five hours passed like a <clears throat> shot because for him, this suited his nature. This was he. And oftentimes you find people who get tremendous satisfaction from the work itself. Again, the Holy Spirit says that every human being has a certain natural natiya, but not everyone has it to that same extent. Now, there are other ways for a person to get satisfaction from work. We had our relative, our ultimate house, and we called in a repairman. We live in Mutsi, and in Mutsi, when we met, but a fellow came, and although his English was not the best, I gotta tell you, he read the situation one, two, three, <clears throat> had the oven pulled, had the problem solved, and he had a tremendous amount of simcha. You could see the joy in his face. It was not the large check that we had to write for the work. <clears throat> it was because a Jewish woman would be able to have her oven on Yontif. There are times when the malach itself, the work itself doesn't bring you satisfaction, but the social environment, the people that you help, whether it be your employees, whether it be your co-workers, whether it be the situation in general, the social setting brings you great satisfaction. And there's a third way that a person can get satisfaction from work, having nothing to do with the innate enjoyment, nor even the social factor. I had an interesting conversation once with a fellow who was working 60 hours a week, basically six, sometimes seven days a week, long after he made a serious amount of money. This was the fellow who was being driven on a regular basis in a stretch limo, and he was still putting in 12-hour days. And at a certain point, I had to ask him, tell me, clearly you're, you've done well, so why is it that you're still putting in these crazy long days, so many hours? And he said to me the following words. He said, well, I guess I just like doing well. Meaning, what he loved about the business was the money that he made. And the proof of the pudding is, there was no great innate satisfaction, no great social satisfaction. His job, his business, was to put washing machine in slum buildings in various bad neighborhoods. 
He got no satisfaction other than the quarters that were coming into his machine on a daily basis. And what gave him the satisfaction was the money. Not the mulacha, not the social element, but the money. And the reality is that there are different factors that can bring a person satisfaction. Sometimes innately in the mulacha, sometimes the social elements, sometimes the money. On rare, rare occasions, all three convene. If you can imagine for a minute, Michael Jordan at the prime of his career. And you have to imagine the scene. Since the time he's a little boy, all he's dreamt about was playing ball. And it's so natural to him. It's such a natural outgrowth of him. And it's so part of him, he just does it. He's got a huge social element. People are cheering him on. Everyone knows his name. Everyone says, Michael, Michael, you're the man. And he's making millions of dollars. You're dealing with a person who has all three. He has a natural inclination for that type of thing. He loves playing ball. He's got tremendous social pressure to encourage him, to let him enjoy it more. And he's making a lot of money. And if you'd imagine, what was it like for Michael Jordan to go to work on a Tuesday regular season? Work. It's the game. It's the league. I love it. It's great. It's, it's every minute is a pleasure. He didn't have to push himself to get out of bed. He didn't have to <clears throat> drive himself. It was him. He was it. And it was a tremendous amount of pleasure that he received because it was innate. He had the social piece and he had a tremendous financial part of it also. Now, this, I believe, <clears throat> is something that is a very eye-opening concept if you think about the following thought. Every Jew has an innate capacity to enjoy learning in the same way that Michael Jordan would enjoy playing ball. And I'll explain to you why it is. Every one of us has an innate understanding that we came from under Kisei Kavu, that we're here in this world for a few short years. Torah is the most valuable process we can ever engage in, and it makes my neshama shine, and it makes me a different human being. I also understand that for eternity, every word is going to be a part of me, is going to remain with me, and because of that, every minute of learning brings me such satisfaction and joy, and yet, that's not quite the experience that most of us have when we sit down to a Gemara. I mean, again, learning is important, learning is good, but I can't say, wow, I can't wait to, wow, I can't wait to the day end so I can open a Gemara and break my head on the Tulsa's and really dig in, wow, what a pleasure. I just can't wait for mundane, silly stuff of my life gets by so I can sit down to learn it. And I'd like to share with you a very interesting observation. And that observation is the only reason why learning is not what I just described, but rather something that we can work on, but it's not so easy and sometimes difficult. Is because of a very interesting quirk. And that is the darkness of physicality. And that means because we human beings are put in this world, and in this world we live in a very, very strong, heavy cloak of physicality, we're unable to feel things, see things that a part of us knows. And if you'd like to hear what I think is a very apt muscle for this, imagine the following. Imagine that you're in the woods one night. You're walking in the woods, and all of a sudden it gets darker and darker, and you hear a thunder, and it starts to rain. And before you realize it, you, you recognize the fact that you're lost. <clears throat> you're in the woods, you're lost, and it's thunder, and you start to hear wolves, and you start to hear all kinds of noises, and you start to tremble, you get scared, and you get terrified, <clears throat> and you realize that you're lost in the woods, and you have no way to make it back to your village. There's no hope. <clears throat> and then somehow, after a very loud thunderclap, there's a bolt of lightning, <clears throat> and for a moment, you see the night light up, and you see your village, and you see exactly where it is. You trace your steps and you begin walking right to where you know, and even though it's dark again, and even though right now it's pitch black, you know which direction it is, and you walk and you walk and you walk, and then suddenly it's dark again, and you don't know where you're going, and you lost your way again, and then there's another lightning bolt, and again you see that village for a moment, and again you head in that direction. That, my friends, I believe is very you have to navigate his way in this world. You see, every one of us 
lives in darkness with the flashes of reality. There are moments of great clarity. They're fleeting, they're short, but there are moments when the darkness of physicality is lifted and we can see things. There are moments when I see things, I recognize them, and I have a vastly different view of everything, especially my life in those moments. One of the great tricks of being a successful person is to chart your course during those lightning flashes of reality. When you see it, when you understand it, and you see exactly where you should be headed, and that's the direction, you use that as your guide, as your compass, and you head that way. Most of us, the vast majority of us, spend our life in dark, dark, deep, deep, thick darkness, and we don't see. But when we have that flash of reality, sometimes it might be on Yom Kippur, sometimes it might be at a funeral, sometimes it might be on a shrewish night, when you're up late and somehow something hits you and you recognize that this stuff is real. It talks to me. I really, really relate to it and I understand exactly what Chazal is saying. When you have that flash of reality, you have to use that as your measuring rod, you have to use it as your guide, as your compass, and you have to keep your track based on that when the darkness comes back, because it will come back, because as long as we're physical, as long as we're alive in this world, that is the reality of this world. And my friends, I believe that that is the answer to how it is that the Jews had greater joy for Kabbalah's Torah than they had in freedom. You see, the Jews, after leaving Mitzrayim, were a different sort of people. They had lived through Dam, Sadeh, Kinim, they lived through a tremendous revelation of Hashem's hand. And they saw with amazing clarity that Hashem is present. Each Maka showed them more clearly, one step after another, that Hashem is here, Hashem created, Hashem maintained, Hashem runs the world. What the Jews saw was that Hashem is absolutely, totally involved in their lives. But it wasn't just the Jews. It was so obvious and so clear. Keep in mind that the midstream were the worst <coughs> imaginable taskmasters. And yet an amazing thing happened. Right before Makkah's Bechoros, Hashem tells Moshe, tell the class all, take a soul. Take the God of the Egyptians, tie it to the bedpost, and leave it there for four days. This was on the 10th of Nisan that they were commanded to do it, and it was to remain there until the 14th. And that's exactly what the Jews do, did. They took the goat or the sheep, tied it to their bedpost, and that's where it stayed. And the Mitzrayim would come, look at their God, their Avodah Zorah, tied to the bedpost, and they would say, what is the meaning of this? And the Jew would say, oh, well, that's, uh, we've tied it up as a carpet because we're going to chef that in four days of the slaughter. Funny you should ask. And says the Medrash, Ki Hashinayim, their teeth chattered. There was nothing the Egyptians could do. Why couldn't they just kill the Jews? They were the taskmasters. They were the powerful <coughs> force of the triumph. The answer is because everyone, even the Egyptians, saw so clearly that Hashem was present, Hashem was involved, and they knew touch a Jew meant your death. And they didn't have the audacity, they didn't have the chutzpah. The Jews took the Avodah of the Egyptians, did it with it as they so wished, and there was nothing the Egyptians could do because everyone got it. Not just the Jews, the Egyptians got it, and all of that was before Kriyas Yamsuf. What every Jew saw in Kriyas Yamsuf was miles and miles, leagues beyond what they had experienced in the months in China. Every Jew during Kriyas Yamsuf reached a level of Navua greater than the greatest Navi. And Navua, my friends, means a very simple thing. The physicality ceases to block. You see, I intuitively know Hashem is present, but my body stops me from experiencing it. I know intuitively there's a thing called Kedusha, but the layers and layers of Gashem is prevented. If a human being were ever to be completely, completely Ruchni, where the Neshama would shine like a brilliant light, the Gashem is physicality would stop it. You and I may not experience that, but every Jew, as they cross the Yamsuf, experienced that, saw Hashem Kavayachal right there, and they reached the level of the Vua, the Spachtus HaGashmis, the physicality no longer stopped them. They were totally, totally clairvoyant in the sense that the Neshama saw from one end of the earth to the other, and they got it. 
They clearly understood why Hashem created them. They clearly understood what they were doing here. And they clearly understood that every action affects them, changes them, molds them for eternity. And it's at that moment that they understood the awesomeness of the day that was approaching. They understood that in but a few days, in but a few weeks, was to be the greatest moment of creation where the Jewish people were to be given the <coughs> task of being the guardian of the reason for creation. They were going to be given the Torah. <coughs> they were to be the ones given the keys to the Bria. They were the ones who would be able to learn Torah from that point. And that understanding of the value of Torah was so powerful to them <coughs> that it superseded any joy that they could have had, any simple that they could have had going from from Abdus to Chirus, this was much greater because they truly understood what they were doing on this planet. Now my friends, I believe that it's a very interesting illustration of what happens to a person when they wake up, when they get it. How their value systems change, how the way they view things change, how their whole reality changes in a flash. But to them it wasn't a lightning bolt that then came back to darkness. It was a blazing clarity of reality. It was daylight. In broad daylight they saw and understood exactly the value of a word of Torah. And therefore they valued this day called Kabbalah Torah so that it was the greatest joy of their lives. And if you'd like to know what Sirius Omer is about, Sirius Omer is as we count the days, we count down the days in anxious anticipation to awaken within ourselves as much as we can that same joy, that same simple, because every Jew innately knows it, every Jew on some level relates to this concept, and as we count, we wait and we count just a few more days, just a few more days, and then, then we'll get, we'll be there. And by the way, if you have trouble counting, just watch little school children this time of year. How many days left? How many days left? How many days left? Right? June 21st is the last day of school. Wow, how many days left? The joy, the joy, and that joy that a little school child feels when they're released for the summer pales, pales by 10,000, 10,000 compared to the joy that a Jew should feel knowing that this is Shavuos, this is the Kabbalah the Torah, this is receiving the Torah, and I have the same opportunity that the Jews have been to be Makabal Torah and to accept it for myself. Now, with that being said, I'd like to share with you something that Ravon points out. He says, why is it that we are not really, really shtigging in learning? Why is it that we're not really growing as much as we can? Why is it that we're not learning as much as we can? He says there are two reasons. Reason number one is because we lack chashidah sator, we lack true value in terms of the, the importance, the significance, and the value of Torah. Number two, he says it's because we lack avas sator, we lack love of Torah. And I'd like to share with you a moshal that I think may help for both. I read that it used to be grape harvest time was a critical time in the life of a farmer. You see, grapes typically come to harvest in a very short period. Yeah, maybe two weeks from the time that they begin becoming ripe until you can pluck, pluck them off the, uh, off the vines. Because before that, they're not ripe. After that two week period, they're already rotten. They'll fall off by themselves and you've lost it. So in that two week period, you have to take all of the grapes, all of the vines, and you have to pluck them. Now, the problem with grape harvesting is that it's a very time consuming job. You can't just beat the vines or crush all the grapes. You have to go by hand and pick off the grapes. Therefore, for the grape farmers, it was always a very critical time. They used to hire a huge team of laborers at any cost because during those two weeks, they either made it or break, it was either make it or break it for them for the entire season. Along came an item called the grape harvester. They now have combines that stretch out across many, many rows of vines and in one hour, this machine, this combine, can do the work of an entire team. What used to take an entire team of laborers two weeks can be accomplished in one hour by this grape harvester. It just goes and collects, gently collects all of the clusters of grapes, gently moves it along the chute, gently puts it into a basket, and gently moves it back, and it goes row after row after row and harvests the entire grape farms. Okay. I believe that that is a very apt muscle effort to us. I'll explain to you what I mean. 
Just last week, a gentleman showed me a cloth of a mezuzah, and that was a beautiful ksaf. It was written by an individual who he learned ksafras by, and he showed me, and I had to admit it was a beautiful ksaf, and he told me that this mezuzah sells for $200. Now, as you know, you can buy a kosher mezuzah, probably $50, $60, certainly $70, you can buy a kosher mezuzah. <clears throat> Should you spend $200 for this mezuzah? Now keep in mind, it's going to be rolled up, sitting in the door. It's not going to, not, you're not going to notice it. <clears throat> no one's going to admire its beauty. I say, if your financial circumstances allow it, it is a wise investment for you to buy the $200 mezuzah as opposed to a $75 mezuzah, mezuzah which is also kosher, because you've invested money in a mitzvah. Zekeli Van Veer is supposed to make your mitzvahs beautiful. If you buy the latest model car, you should buy the best model mezuzah. It's a wise investment, again, assuming that your financial circumstances allow for it, it is a wise investment to spend $200 for that mitzvah of Uksaftim al Mezuzah Pesach. Okay. As you know, tefillin, you could buy tefillin, or you could buy tefillin. You could now spend thousands of dollars to buy a premium pair of tefillin. And again, if your financial circumstances allow for it, it is a wise investment. Because what you've done is taken your money and bought something for eternity. You could also buy a Sefer Torah. Now, even though the Sefer of Hino said the actual midst of Siva Sefer Torah in our day really is fulfilled by buying Svar, even though the Torah says there's a mitzvah of each Jew to write a Sefer Torah, Sefer Hino says in our day age the way to fulfill that is by buying Svarim, because that's what we learn from. However, many people do try to buy a Sefer Torah. You could buy a Sefer Torah now for fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. And again, if your finance is warranted, it's a wise investment. And here's the observation, my friends. If you spend $200 on a mezuzah, thousands of dollars on tefillin, $50,000 on a Sefer Torah, and you fulfill thereby a mitzvah. Ustavtem al mezuzah is one mitzvah. You did it bidura, you did it properly, it's a wise investment for the one mitzvah. Writing a Sefer Torah is one mitzvah. What if I were to share with you the idea that you could easily, like that, fulfill 10 mitzvahs that are equal or greater in value to your mezuzah, to your tefillin, to your buying your $50,000 Sefer Torah? You'd feel a sense of excitement. What if I were to tell you that I have a way for you to fulfill 100 mitzvahs I say, each one equivalent to the mezuzah, to the tefillin, to the Sefer Torah. Chavetz Chaim does the math. The Pasuk in Chumash says that the Barta Bom, you should speak in words of Torah. The Gemara tells us each word of Torah is a separate mitzvah I say. Chavetz Chaim does the math. If a man speaks in a minute 200 words, it means in a minute of learning Torah, you just rattled out 200 mitzvahs I say. Each one of which is shakul kineged kula. It's a mission of peah. Take all the mitzvahs on this side. Take Torah on this side. Torah outweighs it. It is bigger. It is greater than all the other mitzvahs. And what that means in plain language is, if I sit down to a half hour seder and my mouth is moving and I'm rattling out, I'm asking, I'm answering, back and forth speaking, I am accomplishing worlds. Minute after minute, word after word, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of mitzvahs I say, and the only reason we're not excited beyond belief is because we can't believe it. It's too grand, it's too great, and it just sounds so remarkable. Because they'll tell us that's exactly the name of the game. We can't sense it, we can't feel it, feel it because we're very gashy, we're very physical. So it looks to us like whatever, it's a word of Torah, but that's why she said that, it said that, it said that really bad, it just changed the world. That's because we're living in a world of darkness. We're living in a world of physicality. And in this world, we fail to see the value, the extraordinary accomplishments of one mitzvah and certainly a word of the minotaur. But if we're able to get it, if we're able to wake up at some moment in a lightning flash at one point, get it and understand it, we'd have a vastly different view of life. 
We recognize that my machine is a great harvester. What used to take men two weeks, they have to sit there getting all kinds of crews and laborers to pick by hand the harvest. That's the way you fulfill regular mitzvahs. There's a great harvester called the human mouth that can rattle out hundreds, thousands, millions of mitzvahs like diamonds, rattling them out one by one by one after another after another after another. And if I were able to ever get that, if I were ever able to just perceive that clearly, it would vastly change my perception and I would have a tremendous love for learning. You see, every Jew has an intuitive drive to learn. Every Jew, just like every human being, has an intuitive sense of what type of malacha I should do. So too, each Jew has an intuitive love for learning. You will look around the world and you'll find many people who say, I can't find a work that satisfies me. I just can't find a job that suits me. If you look in the Achronim, in the Chavaz of Avos, they say very clearly the reason why a person has trouble finding that malacha is because he's not allowing himself to ask himself the key question, what suits my nature? You see, by nature, I'd be a carpenter. But then that's not coveted to work with my hands. I want a white collar job so I can walk into shul and be proud of my work. <coughs> Truth be told, I'd be in business, but you know, I don't really like the name. I'd rather be a doctor because I get, you know, I get a lot of honor. Says Mar Palanefesh, one of the first Shabbos Lobos, the reason why people cannot find their malacha is not because they don't have a natural inclination. They have a natural inclination, but they won't allow themselves to pursue it because of other reasons, either because they want more money, they assume that they run the world and their actions will determine how much money they make, so they won't allow themselves to do X, Y, or Z, or they want more honor and they won't allow themselves to pursue X, Y, or Z, and they find themselves floundering from job to job, thing to thing, never allowing themselves to pursue what they naturally should gravitate to, what they naturally feel attached to, and they don't make a penny more, they're far more miserable, and they never find job satisfaction. However, each human being has that intuitive sense. And so, so too, my friends, every Jew has a tremendous natural love for learning. It's intuitive, it's a part of me, but you got to learn to allow it to come to the fore. One of the ways to allow yourself to feel it is to recognize the extraordinary value, to recognize that each word is a separate mitzvah. Each mitzvah is greater than any other mitzvah in the Torah. It accomplishes more for the world, it accomplishes more for me, and it's diamonds after diamonds after diamonds that are racking it up. And even though to me right now it sounds far-fetched and it doesn't sound real, that's because again I view things with very physical eyes, I don't view things with the true perspective, but every once in a while you get it, whether it's on a Yom Kippur, whether it's on a Shuas, you wake up and you see the reality like a lightning bolt, and you recognize it, you feel it, you sense it, this really talks to me. I really recognize its value, and when you feel it, you have to use that as your beacon. You have to see it as a searchlight in the dark, that one moment of clarity, you have to then chart your course by that, because that was your moment when you actually got it. I think there's a tremendous lesson to learn from what the Sefer Chinim is saying. To the Jews leaving Mitzrayim, they reached a level of clarity and understanding, they really got it. Because they lived through months and months of Hashem showing them, because they lived through Kriyash Yamsuf, they got it with absolute clarity, not like a lightning bolt at night, like the sun at midday, the darkness was lifted, they saw things with absolute clarity, they recognized that every action that I do shapes me, molds me into what I will be for eternity. And because of that, they recognize the extraordinary value of every mitzvah, and that surely the mitzvah called Limit Torah. So even though it's true, they were slaves and now they were freed, and that sense of freedom brought them such joy, wow! We're now free people and we're now <coughs> thrown off that bondage. There was a greater joy to them, the fact that they knew and understood that we're coming to Kabbalah's Torah. In just a few more days, I'm going to receive the Torah. I'm going to have that great harvest of my mouth will be that combine, a machine that can rattle off not hundreds, but thousands, millions that it could accomplish what people take weeks, months, years to do. I can accomplish in a half hour because they recognize the value of a single mitzvah. They recognize the tremendous opportunity and it filled them with a joy that was unparalleled. And what we do now, when we count Sirius Omer, is we count to try to awaken within ourselves that anticipation. How many days are left? How many days do we have to wait? 
like a little school kid waiting to get out, we wait for that Kabbalah Torah because we're trying to awaken that same sense within ourselves. Just like every person has an atiyah, an inclination to a particular type of malach, every Jew has a chilek in Torah, every Jew is given a portion of Torah, and every Jew has a natural aspiration for Torah. Some people are more Ian oriented some people are more Matthias, some more halacha, some more Torah, but each person has their own individual area. You have to develop it, much like a wine, you have to learn to taste the wine, you have to learn to develop a taste of it, you have to learn to appreciate it, but every Jew has a natural inclination towards it, and the way, the secret to it is to understand the extraordinary value. Once you understand the value, then automatically it becomes much more chashu, much more important, and you learn to appreciate what it is. I'd like to close with a with a mushal that I borrowed from the Chavetz Chaim. I updated it a little bit, but I think it well defines this very concept. Imagine for a minute the following. You're called to your grandfather's deathbed. Now, your grandfather, he knew some of the history. He had grown up in, in Europe before the war. He escaped barely with his life. He escaped the Nazis. He came back to America and rebuilt his life. He did well, established himself. He's now a patriarch of his family. And you heard rumors along the years that back in Europe they had been wealthy beyond belief. Here, you know, he did okay, but he never reached anything like that. In any case, you're invited to his call to his deathbed, and you go there, and your grandfather calls you close and says, Come listen, come. I want to tell you what it was like in Europe before the, before the Nazis. We were so wealthy. My family had been wealthy for generations. We did not own real estate. We owned cities. We did not own businesses. We owned industries. We owned forests. We owned railroads. We were wealthy beyond any description. In 1933, Hitler came to power, and I knew what it meant. The war didn't begin until 39. I spent those years liquidating everything I could. I sold all the businesses, I sold the forests, I sold everything. And I exchanged it for the most liquid commodity that I could find, and that was diamonds. And before the war started, I went to this particular mountain, and I buried ten canisters of precious diamonds, each one 100 yards from the other. And when I came to these shores, I vowed that none of my children nor my grandchildren should ever step foot back in that cursed country. And now I realize I'm going to my deathbed, and I realize it's not just my wealth, but it was my grandfather's, and my grandfather before him, and it wouldn't be right to leave it buried by that mountain. Here's the map, here are the locations, I want you to go dig it up. And with those words, he expires. Now, after the shiva, after everyone goes home, the first thing you do is you get on a plane. You get on a plane and you head to that mountain. You take that map and you find exactly that mountain and you find exactly where that X is and you start digging. And I guarantee you, you don't act with laziness. You don't wait for a week to pass. You don't dig in one place and say, well, whatever, I'll just, you know, I'll find the next year or next week. You dig and you dig and you dig with a feverish burning. You dig with an unbelievable energy until you actually find a canister. You pull it up, you open it, and you see diamonds, gorgeous, precious diamonds poured out into your hands. You've never seen such wealth. And you realize there are nine more canisters. You run, you dig, you run, you dig. You're not hungry, you're not thirsty. You don't know what sleep means. You don't know anything other than digging up, digging up, digging up more and more. Says the Chavetz don't you understand that's exactly what Limerat Torah is about? Before each Jew was created, they were given a chalim in Torah. Yagati umatsasi means you found that which was hidden for you before you created. Each Jew was given a chalik in Torah that's your portion, no one else's, those are your condition, that's your area in Torah. And what that means is it's waiting for you, it's been buried by the mountain, and all you have to do is dig it up. You see, when you go out to earn a living, maybe you'll make a living, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll make a killing, maybe you won't. But if this was hidden for you, buried in the mountain, and this is your chalik in Torah, all you have to do is dig it up. It's a different fever pitch drive that you pursue it with. 
And if my friends, if we could ever get this one marshal clear, if I could ever understand that Torah waits for me, it's my Torah, my Chelek Torah, no other Jew in history can ever reveal that which I can, no other Jew in the course of creation can ever understand this part of Torah as I can. It's my Chelek waiting for me and its value is beyond any human description. That, my friends, is a tremendous insight and understanding our relationship to Torah. And if I can ever get it, wake up to understand that muscle, I can understand the drive and the energy with which I have to pursue learning. It is true, sometimes it's difficult to learn. We're busy, we have a lot of responsibilities, a lot of things. Sometimes it's hard to leave the house. Sometimes it's hard to learn it at home. Sometimes it's difficult for many, many different reasons. But if I understood the value, if I understood it's my healing, if I understood intuitively it's a part of me, if something comes naturally to me, I'd be driven, I'd be motivated, I'd go through any sort of horrible, horrible pain, any difficulty, and I'd accomplish it. May Hashem grant us a successful Kabbal Satora and an understanding of exactly what Chazal meant.